The F-105 is the first fighter aircraft designed for all-weather tactical air missions. The aircraft possesses the essential qualities of high speed, rapid rate of climb, good G potential, and satisfactory roll capabilities. Excellent stability and maneuvering characteristics in ground attack deliveries at both high and low speeds are provided by the aircraft's basic design, the highly loaded swept wing. As with any type of aircraft, however, to get the best performance, the pilot must carefully observe the established aircraft limitations at all times. This flight is on its way to the gunnery range for a routine training mission. During this mission, many realistic weapons delivery techniques will be practiced. This mission began before takeoff with a detailed briefing by the flight leader. Each man was briefed on his part in the mission and particular emphasis was placed on the importance of pilot knowledge of minimum recovery altitudes and delivery techniques. missions are carried out to help the pilot obtain a high degree of proficiency in ordnance delivery. The results of deliveries during these training missions are recorded, analyzed, and evaluated. accumulated data, the safest and most effective techniques for ground attack operations are developed. For example, this pilot presses his minimums to score a good hit. But note how careful he is to keep his aircraft above the minimum permissible altitude. He knows that to do otherwise may subject pilot and plane to the danger of being destroyed during the course of weapons delivery. Remember, the boys use their F-105 to the best of its capabilities. To get the best results using the depressed pipper during ground attack maneuvers, the pilot must position his aircraft at a specified point in space, at a certain dive angle, at the proper airspeed, and ensure that all these variables are brought together simultaneously. deviation from these established release conditions will greatly increase a pilot's CEA. Let's set up and analyze a typical rocket run situation. The pilot will follow the SOPs established for the delivery of this ordinance. A pilot takes advantage of all the aids which will enable him to get into the best position for optimum delivery of his weapons. For example, the command markers can be used as a cross-reference to serve as an important aid in arriving at the desired delivery conditions. With our target at sea level, the altimeter command marker is set for the desired AGL, 2200 feet. The airspeed command marker is set for a speed of 400 knots. and the desired Mach 0.63 is set into the Mach command marker. Now let's see how this particular rocket run is successfully accomplished. From its prescribed base leg, the F-105 enters a 30-degree dive angle and accelerates to a speed of 400 knots. Following procedures established for this ground attack maneuver, at 2200 feet AGL and at 4400 feet slant range, the rockets are fired. For successful recovery, the pilot immediately starts his pullout at the planned G's. 
This keeps his aircraft out of range of his own weapons and assures adequate ground clearance. Remember that a poor base leg is the first indication of a bad pass. Any time an aircraft is put into a dive during ground attack maneuvers, the pilot must plan and use techniques which will guarantee a successful recovery. Otherwise, he will find himself in a dangerous situation. For there's no denying that steep dives at low altitudes, which are part of any type of ground attack maneuver, are inherently dangerous. If the pilot follows established procedures, however, no problems will be encountered. Using the dive recovery chart from the Dash 1, let's look at several dive recovery situations. Consider an aircraft at 450 knots, at 4,000 feet, in a 45 degree dive. The pilot makes a pullout of four Gs. In this case, the amount of altitude used during the dive recovery is 3,000 feet, leaving 1,000 feet ground clearance. For any number of reasons, assume that the airspeed increases to 500 knots. This is what happens. You can readily see that in this situation, the recovery altitude required increases to 3,700 feet, leaving only 300 feet ground clearance. Still using 500 knots, increase the dive angle to 50 degrees while still pulling four Gs, and the recovery altitude becomes, well, to say the least, critical. Remember, any combination of increased airspeed and steeper dive angle results in a recovery altitude that is inadequate. Never figure that you have a couple of Gs left in the bank that allow you to press minimums. Plan your delivery in accordance with the normal number of Gs you would pull. Then fly the aircraft as planned. You must begin the pullout from a dive as soon as your ordnance is expended. Don't make the mistake of hanging on too long to get a better hit or to see what kind of hit you did get. Always keep in mind that the basic recovery factors are constant. Here are examples of how additional altitude is lost by hanging onto a dive for one second too long. In a 30 degree dive at 400 knots, an additional altitude of 340 feet would be lost. At 450 knots, 380 feet additional. And at 500 knots, 420 feet. And so on, proportionately in relation to speed and dive angle. Altitude lost at the start of recovery is always reflected in the bottoming out altitude. All aircraft, regardless of size, weight, wing loading, power, or type, obey the same law of physics in recovering from a dive. The three variables associated with dive recovery for any type of aircraft are true airspeed, acceleration or g-force, and dive angle. This is an old Jenny, a craft of World War I vintage. In those early days, pilots had to contend with many of the same basic problems as those which bug today's pilots. As can be seen from this pilot's situation, dive recovery is one of them. He puts the Jenny into a steep dive. As his airspeed increases, he rapidly nears the ground and realizes he could be in a predicament. But he is smart and knows his minimum recovery altitudes and is able to make his normal dive recovery. Here's the point we want to make. Even though there's a big age difference between old Jenny and our modern F-105, were the two aircraft to attain the same airspeed, pull the same amount of Gs at the same dive angle, they would require exactly the same amount of recovery altitude. Thus, even though technology continues to advance at a rapid rate, the basic principles of aerodynamics and physics with respect to our modern weapons systems remain unchanged. The F-105 is equipped with speed brakes to assist the pilot in controlling airspeed during a dive. Should excess speed be attained at low altitude, apply the speed brakes immediately. The speed brakes in the F-105 are most effective and their speed reducing benefits will be apparent at once during any marginal dive recovery. 
further, use of these brakes does not restrict the G's attainable. While extension of the speed brakes increases the aft stick required to pull a given G due to a reduction in stabilizer effectiveness, sufficient stabilizer travel is still available to attain either structural limits or the maximum lift. The continuous development of modern fighter aircraft has led to longer fuselages of much higher density. During flight, this results in slightly longer response time to pitch control inputs. Because the F-105 is one of these larger aircraft with a long high density fuselage, its longitudinal response characteristics are relatively slower than the earlier smaller aircraft. However, this flight characteristic will not be apparent in normal maneuvers. Suppose the pilot finds himself in an abnormal flight situation. Let's demonstrate with a hypothetical but realistic dive recovery situation. The first portion of the dive proceeds normally. You are pulling slightly less than 1G during the tracking phase. Consider the variables associated with recovery from a dive carried to too low an altitude and which results in a panic situation. Most important of these variables are stick position and G's. Pitch rate should also be considered. From concentrating on the target, target fixation, you suddenly find yourself much too low. In such a critical situation, your first action will almost certainly be a very large aft stick input in an effort to make the quickest possible recovery. Instinctively, you grab a handful of stick. In fact, you've put in enough aft stick for 15 or 16 Gs. You don't seem to be recovering from the dive fast enough. Nothing seems to be happening fast enough except the approaching ground, and that's coming at you too fast. As a matter of fact, the pitch rate started up the moment the stabilizer moved. Still, the G's, which are really what's going to pull you out of this dive, seem too slow in coming on. Actually, the G's started up only about one quarter second after the stick moved. It just seems too slow because you see that hard ground zooming up at you. All of a sudden, you sense the G's coming on too fast and heading for the 14 to 15 G's which the stabilizer would give. Also, the pitch rate has increased rapidly to about 40 degrees per second. Now you can feel this rising pitch rate, plus the exceedingly fast rate in G buildup. You continue to call for more G's than are on the aircraft. As long as the stick is aft of this point, this stick position calls for X number of G's. As a result, the G's continue to increase until the G's and the stick correspond. Now you put a lot of forward stick in to get the G's down from the 5, 6, or 7 that it went up to before being checked. You continue to push the stick forward, perhaps even to full forward. The G's respond, going rapidly from high positive values in stall buffet down to negative values within a second. It can reach the range of minus 2 to 2.5, depending on the amount of stick used. You're on a rough ride and can become completely disoriented. You continue to chase the G's around with the stick. What you should do is either hold the stick slightly aft or let go of it completely. This action causes the oscillations to dampen themselves out with or without the stab aug engaged. Finding yourself in a too low, too steep, too fast or too late box you're almost certain to make this kind of gross stick movement as a matter of self-preservation. The solution to getting out of this kind of tight spot is self-control. Once you've got the nose of the aircraft above the horizon, restrain yourself from making those second, third, fourth, and so on violent movements with the stick. Don't hammer the stick into the instrument panel. We repeat, for this is important. Just hold the stick slightly aft, or release it, and the aircraft will take care of straightening itself out. We have demonstrated
demonstrated some of the flight characteristics of the F-105 aircraft during ground attack maneuvers and minimum dive recovery situations. We have seen that the F-105 is designed to permit the pilot to deliver his weapons on target safely and accurately. Here's a final reminder. The better the pilot understands the flight characteristics of the F-105 aircraft, and the more closely he follows the criteria established for its performance, the greater his chances are for successful and effective weapons delivery. In flying the F-105, it is important that the pilot select an established pattern which fits his particular mission and that he determine that adequate clearance exists above the ground and from his own ordnance. Once the pilot has selected his plan, he should stick with it and not deviate from the procedures with respect to airspeed, dive angle and altitude.